My name is Ruth. I'm 32. And until a few weeks ago, I felt like I had my life sorted out. For the past five years, I have been employed by this large corporation as a translator. I live in the city and rent a little flat. Nothing special. But it's mine, you know. Weekends are spent attending dance classes. It's what I do. After a week of looking at computer displays and translating foreign languages, it helps me relax. Friends? Yes, I do have a few. We occasionally go out for drinks and see movies. It's not much, but I think it's sufficient. But that's where things get tricky, with family. You see, Emma is my younger sister. She has always been her mother's favorite, the golden child. Dad simply followed his mother's wishes. That has always been the case as far back as I can recall. As we got older, not much altered. Emma received the support, recognition, and attention. Me? I was an afterthought, simply there. I separated myself, like any self-respecting afterthought would do. Calls decreased, and visits were even more infrequent. In that way, it was less painful and easier. Then my phone rang out of the blue. It's your mother, Ruth. Your dad is hoping to see you. Could you visit this weekend? I almost dropped my phone. Did dad want to come visit me? That was novel. Yes, I suppose I could make it. Everything all right? Come on over, Ruth. At two on Saturday. Avoid being late. I was standing outside my parents' opulent home on Saturday. Undoubtedly, it was very different from my rented place. I inhaled deeply before pressing the doorbell. Mom replied, examining me from head to toe as though evaluating a piece of furniture. Here you are. Enter now. When I entered, they were all there. Dad, slumped on his armchair, looking thin and worn out. Emma was sitting next to her husband Richard on the couch, looking as flawless as ever. I had only had a few encounters with him. He was older than Emma and constantly preoccupied with work or other affluent men's pursuits. I said, attempting to sound casual, Hey everyone, what's going on? Dad gave me a sad but resolute face as he glanced up at me. Sit down, Ruth. We must have a conversation. With a beating heart, I sat down. Dad looked terrible, the worst I'd ever seen. His face was drawn and pallid, and his once strong frame appeared to have shrunk. Ruth, he said in a tremulous but calm voice, I'm dying, darling. My physicians believe that I don't have much time left. I whimpered, No, tears starting to form in my eyes. There must be something they can do. Dad gently shook his head. Ruth, I've considered every possibility. I should organize my affairs now. I saw Mom and Emma look at each other. I couldn't quite read something in their eyes. Dad went on. I've called you all here today for that reason. I'd like to talk about my will. The room's vibe abruptly changed. Thick, oppressive tension was palpable. Dad turned to look at me after glancing at Mom and Emma. I've given this a lot of thought, Dad replied. The city apartment will go to your mother. Emma, this mansion is yours to inherit. Emma gave a slight smile as she nodded. And Ruth? Dad stopped, his eyes meeting mine. I decided to leave you my savings, all $550,000 of it. No one moved for a brief moment. No one said anything. Then everything went crazy. What? Mom let out a cry, her face twisted in fury. You can't be serious, John. Emma got up with a start. That's not fair, Dad. Ruth is no longer even remotely related to this family. With unexpected power, Dad slammed his fist against the arm of his chair. This is my choice, and it's set in stone. Margaret, you've had much too much power over me. Do of you, do of your fixation on Emma, I have neglected Ruth. Not once again. His eyes softened as he turned to face me. I'm very sorry, Ruth. Will you ever be able to pardon me? I approached him without thinking and put my arms around his thin frame. Obviously, Dad. Naturally. 
I'm sorry for you. With a love-filled, if shaky grip, he returned the hug. He withdrew after a moment, his face displaying signs of tiredness. I'm worn out right now. I must take a nap. When Dad went back to his room, I was met with my sister's and mother's enraged looks. Mom growled, her voice brimming with malice. You have to say no to the money. Emma is the rightful recipient of it. I remained firm, feeling a surge of rage within me. Not at all. I honor Dad's decision because that's his. Emma narrowed her eyes and took a step closer. Ruth, you'll regret doing this. Take note of what I say. Emma followed me out the house, taunting me. Look at you by yourself. Nobody desires you. My hubby is rich and kind. What's in your possession? Richard laughed too, and as I made my way to my car, the sound bothered me. The next fortnight was terrible. My phone would ring every day with texts from Emma and Mom. They insisted that I give up the inheritance and were unyielding. I disregarded each one of them. I poured myself into my work, hoping to use the sound of my keyboard to drown out their voices. Then the call arrived on a gloomy Tuesday morning. Dad has passed away. Driving to the funeral, I experienced numbness. The service was a haze of dark attire and serious expressions. Emma and Mom put on quite the show, holding each other and crying hysterically. I took a step back, my heart a silent, hollow mass of anguish. We all met at the house after the service. Emma flaunted her purse like a flag and made a big deal out of the money she'd taken out to cover the funeral costs. She declared, I've got it all here, to anyone who would listen. Thousands of dollars. The least I could do for Daddy would be this. I began packing as the last of the visitors began to leave. That's when everything went crazy. Emma! Her cry pierced the gloomy environment like a blade. My money has vanished. It's been stolen by someone. I froze, a chill running down my spine. Something about this felt wrong. Mom's eyes locked onto me cold and accusing. It must have been someone who was here the whole time, she said, her voice dripping with insinuation. Empty your purse, Ruth. Now. I stood my ground, anger bubbling up inside me. Number, this is ridiculous. I haven't taken anything. Then you won't mind proving it, Emma sneered. Before I could respond, Richard was on the phone. Yes, police? We'd like to report a theft. My heart pounded as we waited for the police to arrive. This couldn't be happening. Not today of all days. The officers were professional but firm. Ma'am, we're going to need to check your bag, one of them said. Trapped, I handed over my purse. The officer opened it, reached inside, and pulled out a wad of cash and Emma's credit cards. The room exploded into chaos. Mom and Emma hurled accusations and insults, their voices rising to a fever pitch. I stood there, shell-shocked, trying to make sense of what was happening. I didn't do this, I stammered. I swear I don't know how those got there. But my protests fell on deaf ears. At the police station I sat in a cold, sterile room, my mind reeling. Then, to my surprise, Mom walked in. For a fleeting moment, I thought she might have come to help me. I should have known better. She leaned in close, her voice a venomous whisper. Give up the inheritance, Ruth. Do it, or you'll rot in jail. Everyone will know you as the rat who steals from her own family. Is that what you want? I felt something snap inside me. Years of neglect. Of being the family outcast. Of taking their abuse. It all came to a head in that moment. No, I hissed back. No, I won't give it up. Do your worst. Mom's face twisted with fury. Fine, enjoy prison, you ungrateful trash. She stormed out, leaving me alone with my anger and a newfound determination. I managed to post bail and get out of that hellhole, but my troubles were far from over. As I stumbled into my apartment, exhausted and angry, my phone rang. It was my boss, Mark. Ruth, 
We need to talk, he said, his voice tense. I received a call today. Someone told me about the theft accusations against you. I felt the blood drain from my face. Mark, I swear I didn't... I believe you, Ruth, he cut in. But we can't have this kind of scandal at the office. Not right now. I'm putting you on unpaid leave until this blows over. The line went dead, and with it, my last shred of composure. I sank to the floor, hot tears streaming down my face. I cried until I had no tears left. Then something changed inside me. The sadness gave way to a cold, hard fury. With shaking hands, I pulled out my laptop and navigated to Emma's Facebook page. There, staring back at me, were post after post of luxury cars. Which one should I get? She'd written just days before Dad's death. The timestamp mocked me. They'd planned this all along, even before Dad was gone. That was it. The final straw. I picked up my phone and dialed a number I'd never thought I'd use. Jackson Investigations. A gruff voice answered. I need your help, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. I need dirt on my sister and mother. They've set me up and I'm going to prove it. The private investigator, a man named Mike, listened to my story without comment. When I finished, he let out a low whistle. Family drama, huh? Those are always the nastiest. I'll see what I can dig up. For two weeks, I waited. Finally, Mike called back. I've got good news and bad news, he said. The bad news is your mom and sister are careful. They haven't discussed the inheritance or the theft where anyone could overhear. My heart sank. And the good news? I could almost hear his grin through the phone. Your sister's been a bad girl. I've got solid evidence she's cheating on that rich husband of hers. The next morning, I sent a carefully worded message to Richard, my sister's husband. Attached was a photo of Emma entering a hotel with a young, handsome man who definitely wasn't Richard. Interested in what happens next, I wrote. Meet me at Café Noir at 2 p.m. Richard showed up right on time, his face a mask of barely contained rage. I laid out everything I had. Photos, videos, even recordings of Emma laughing about Richard's age and how she was only with him for his money. She said, I'm boring in bed. Richard growled, his knuckles white as he gripped his coffee cup. She's disgusted by me. I nodded sympathetically. I'm sorry, Richard. You deserve to know the truth. He looked up at me, his eyes hard. What do you want from me? Why show me this? I leaned in close. I want revenge, Richard. On Emma. On my mother. They set me up and tried to frame me for theft. I need your help to prove it. The next few days felt like an eternity. I paced my apartment, checking my phone obsessively, waiting for word from Richard. Finally, on the fourth day, my phone buzzed with a message. I've got what you need. Meet me. My heart raced as I drove to our agreed meeting spot, a quiet park on the outskirts of town. Richard was already there, looking grim but satisfied. Listen to this, he said, handing me a small USB drive. I plugged it into my laptop and suddenly heard my mother's voice, clear as day. I can't believe how well it worked, she cackled. You should have seen Ruth's face when they found the money in her purse. Emma's laughter joined in. It was priceless. She actually thought she could get away with Dad's money. Now she'll have to give up the inheritance. Mom said smugly, she can't risk going to jail. I felt a mix of emotions wash over me. Vindication, anger, and fierce determination. This is perfect, I told Richard. Thank you. He nodded, his face hard. I'm filing for divorce tomorrow. According to our prenup, if Emma cheats, she gets nothing. In fact, she'll owe me. The day of the will reading arrived faster than I expected. As I walked into the notary's office, I saw them all there, Mom, Emma, and Richard. Mom and Emma wore matching smug expressions, 
clearly expecting me to cave and give up my inheritance. The notary cleared his throat, ready to begin, but I held up a hand. Before we start, I have something to say. Mom and Emma exchanged gleeful glances, probably thinking I was about to renounce my claim. Oh, how wrong they were. I know what you did, I said, my voice steady. I know you set me up and planted that money in my purse, and I can prove it. Before they could react, I pressed play on the recording. Their own voices filled the room, confessing to their scheme. Mom and Emma's faces drained of color. How? How did you get that? Emma stuttered. That's when Richard stood up. I recorded it, he said, his voice cold. I heard everything. Emma's eyes widened in panic. Richard, I don't understand. Why did you do this? He cut her off by tossing a manila envelope on the table. Outspilled photos of Emma with her lover. Save it, he spat. I know all about your affair, too. I'm filing for divorce, and according to our prenup, you don't get a cent. In fact, you'll be paying me. The room erupted into chaos. Mom and Emma started shouting, tears streaming down their faces. But their cries were cut short by a new voice. You're under arrest. We all turned to see two police officers entering the room. I'd called them earlier, providing evidence of the false accusation and blackmail attempt. As the officers led Mom and Emma away in handcuffs, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. It was over. I'd won. The notary, who had watched the whole scene unfold with wide eyes, cleared his throat again. Well, um, shall we proceed with the reading of the will? I nodded, finally ready to honor my father's last wishes. As the notary read out the details confirming my inheritance, I couldn't help but think of Dad. I hope you're proud of me, I thought. I didn't let them push me around anymore. The aftermath of that day in the notary's office was a whirlwind. True to my expectations, the lawsuit against Mom and Emma was a slam dunk. With the recorded evidence and the police report, their guilt was indisputable. The judge didn't go easy on them. Attempting to frame your own daughter and sister, he said, his voice dripping with disgust. I've seen a lot in this courtroom, but this takes the cake. The verdict came down hard. Mom and Emma were ordered to pay a massive fine directly to me. The amount was so large I almost felt dizzy when I heard it. Mom's face turned ashen when she realized what this meant. But, but I'll have to sell the apartment, she stammered. The judge showed no mercy. Perhaps you should have thought of that before engaging in criminal behavior, Mrs. Thompson. Emma didn't fare any better. With the divorce proceedings in full swing, she was forced to sell the house Dad had left her. Most of that money went to Richard, as per their prenup. But a significant chunk came to me as part of the court-ordered compensation. I watched from a distance as their lives unraveled. The apartment I'd grown up in, the house where we had that fateful meeting about Dad's will, both sold to strangers. Mom and Emma were left with almost nothing. As for me, life was looking up. With Dad's inheritance and the lawsuit money, I was suddenly in a very comfortable financial position. The first thing I did was quit my translation job. As understanding as Mark had been, the whole experience had left a bad taste in my mouth. Instead, I decided to invest in myself. I'd always had a passion for languages beyond just translating them. With my newfound resources, I enrolled in a prestigious linguistics program. It was challenging, but for the first time in years, I felt truly alive. I also bought myself a beautiful apartment in the heart of the city. The rest of the money I invested wisely. I worked with a financial advisor to set up a portfolio that would provide me with a steady income. It wasn't about being rich. It was about having the freedom to live life on my own terms. Months passed, and slowly the dust began to settle. I heard through the grapevine that Mom had moved to a small rental on the outskirts of town. Emma, last I knew, was crashing on a friend's couch. 
her dreams of luxury cars and easy living shattered. Richard, true to his word, had divorced Emma and left her with nothing. He sent me a brief email thanking me for opening his eyes. I'm traveling the world now, he wrote, living the life I always wanted without dead weight holding me back. I owe you one. As for me, I was thriving. My studies were going well. I'd made new friends who appreciated me for who I was, and for the first time in my life, I felt truly independent. A few months flew by in a whirlwind of activity. With my newfound financial stability and a burning desire to make something of myself, I decided to take the plunge and open my own language school. It felt right, combining my passion for linguistics with my experience as a translator, Thompson Language Academy. I used tracing the words on the freshly painted sign. It had a nice ring to it. Recruiting teachers was easier than I'd expected. There were plenty of talented linguists out there looking for an opportunity, and soon I had a solid team teaching everything from French to Mandarin, catering to both adults and kids. One evening, as I was locking up the school, my phone buzzed with a message. It was from Richard. Hey Ruth, I'm back in town. Heard about your new school. Fancy celebrating your success over a glass of wine? I hesitated for a moment. Richard and I had parted on good terms after the whole inheritance debacle, but we'd never been close. Still, I owed him for helping me expose Emma and Mom's scheme. Sure, I texted back. My place, 8 p.m. That night, Richard showed up at my door with a bottle of expensive red wine and a warm smile. We settled on the couch, glasses in hand, and started chatting. As the wine flowed, so did the conversation. Richard told me about his travels, his eyes lighting up as he described the places he'd seen and the people he'd met. I found myself opening up too, telling him about the challenges and joys of starting my own business. It felt nice. As the night wore on and the wine bottle emptied, I realized I was seeing a whole new side of Richard. I'm not sure who made the first move. Maybe it was the wine. Maybe it was the newfound connection. Or maybe it was just the culmination of all the changes in our lives. But suddenly, we were kissing. The following morning, I awoke to find Richard awake and observing me with a mixture of uncertainty and affection. Ruth, he said in a serious tone, I have to tell you the truth. I admit that I wasn't always the best person. I undervalued you and made fun of you and Emma. I apologize for my error. With my heart racing, I listened. Where was this headed? He inhaled deeply. But I realized something last night. Ruth, you are an amazing woman. I would like a second opportunity, a chance to get things right this time. Would you be open to dating me? I gazed at him, my thoughts racing. In a relationship with Richard, my sister's former spouse? It was insane, really insane. Still, though, yes, I said to myself, let's give it a shot. Richard's expression brightened, and I had to chuckle out as he leaned in to kiss me. I would have thought someone was crazy if they had told me a year ago that I would be dating my sister's ex-husband. But here I was, setting out on yet another unforeseen adventure. The past called, just as I felt that my relationship with Richard was flowering and the language school was operating smoothly, and things had returned to normal. In the true sense, I heard an irate person hammering on my front door on a peaceful Sunday afternoon. When I opened it, Emma's angry expression was distorted. She pushed past me and into the flat, screaming, You're backstabbing trash! You and Richard are well known to me. Have you not wanted to take him away from me all along? You've always been envious of my possessions? I became more enraged myself. That is absurd, Emma. Richard broke up with you due of your infidelity. Recall? Oh, please, she cut in, her venomous voice dripping. Like he would stick by you. Ruth, there's nothing unique about you. Unlike me, you're not beautiful. Like everyone else. He will abandon you. 
Her remarks hurt, reviving old fears I had believed I had moved past. But I was no longer such a pushover. With a low, menacing voice, I commanded them to leave. Leave my house and remain absent from my life. Emma, we're done for good. After giving me a long, glaring look, she stormed out, slamming the door behind her. I collapsed into the sofa, feeling sick all over. I tried to get over my sickness and uneasiness for the remainder of the day, but I was in a fog. However, as the nausea lingered throughout the following day, I began to feel uneasy in a different way. I bought a pregnancy test at the pharmacy on the spur of the moment. Good. I had a baby. My thoughts raced. A baby at this point? Richard needed to know. After all, he was also influenced by this. I got ready for his response, ready for anything from happiness to rage to a quick exit. Richard remained silent for quite some time after I told him the news. Then, much to my surprise, he gave me a tight hug and let out a loud sigh. Richard? I questioned, perplexed by his response. He withdrew, a playful twinkle in his eye. Well, Ruth, I'm afraid you're going to regret this. Heart palpitating, I fixed my gaze on him. What do you mean? His grave demeanor gave way to a broad smile. Because you will now have to spend years with me. Are you going to marry me? It was the second time in a few days that I had been completely taken aback. But instead of the earlier sadness, excitement welled up inside of me this time. Yes, I said shedding joyful tears down my cheeks. Yes, I'll marry you. I was amazed at how far I'd come, from a mistreated daughter to a successful company owner, from a victim of my family's plots to a lady starting her own family. As we shared a kiss to celebrate our engagement and the new life growing inside me. Now that I'm organizing our wedding, I understand there will be two noticeable absences. Emma and Mom are not invited. I know it's the right choice, even though it's a bittersweet one. I'm creating a new life for myself, one that is happy, respectful, and full of love. Their poisoning has run its course.